Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Pearson Center. I hope you'll get to know our foundation, the Pearson Center. You can find us online, pearsoncenter.ca. And we think one of the wonderful attributes of having an agency like ours at this time during a pandemic is that when we truly need to come together as a nation to pay tribute to the Prime Minister, we have an avenue to do so. The Pearson Center has been spending an awful lot of time during this pandemic talking actually to over 6,000 unique visitors through our multiple webinars throughout the last few months. So we hope you may join us again. But today's a special day for us. It's not every day we get to pay tribute to a gracious, right honorable John Turner. And I'm delighted to introduce our moderator who joins us from TVO. And of course, is the host of his own show, The Agenda at TVO. We all know Steve Mason. We're delighted you're joining us and you'll moderate today. We've got a great panel of people who really knew our John Turner well. Um, Sheila Copps, of course, our former deputy prime minister of the country who served with him when he was leader of our party. The Honorable uh, Erwin Kotler, who is our former justice minister and worked for our Prime Minister when he was the Justice Minister. So the wheel keeps going around. And of course we have Mark Keeley. Many people know Mark in many ways, but we know him as truly the political son of the Right Honorable John Turner. And he's got lots of great stories, some he may not be able to tell. But I <laughs> before we're done, do that fantastic imitation of our John Turner. So oh, over sorry. to you, please. Uh, delighted to be joining us as our moderator today. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sandra. It's great to be here to remember a truly great Canadian. And I guess I want to start with Erwin Kotler because when John Turner was the Justice Minister in the late 60s, early 70s, he did have a long haired, far left, radical student who had a Che Guevara poster on his office wall as part of his team of advisors. Uh, Mr. Kotler, who might that have been? Well, you know, when I first came to work with uh, John Turner, uh, straight out of uh, Yale Law School, he already had three advisors, uh, Lloyd Axworthy, uh, Jerry Grafstein, and David Smith, uh, all of whom went on to having uh, distinguished political careers. But they warned Turner against hiring me. And then once I was hired, uh, they warned him because I was the speechwriter that if he did say what I was writing, that would be the end of him. Never mind about myself. But you know, we ended up having a wonderful relationship. He became my uh, mentor, uh, really my teacher in in many ways, and my role model. So when I became justice minister 35 years later, the lessons learned uh, with John Turner were really lessons that I internalized and sought to act upon as both an MP and as Justice Minister. And he taught me initially the importance of Parliament, which he, he always used to say, politics is the highest calling. But what he meant really was that Parliament was the linchpin of democracy, that Parliament was the lifeblood of democracy. And that was a commitment that I never forgot. And in fact, that commitment inspired me throughout my life, not just during my years as a parliamentarian. So he had a, an incredibly uh, impactful uh, influence on my life. And as I said, when I became justice minister, I just sought to act upon that inspiration. Sheila Copps, I guess your longest period of, um, of um, um, simpatico with John Turner would have been when he was leader of the opposition, uh, facing um, a, a very large majority government on the other side, the biggest one in Canadian history. Uh, he sadly led the Liberals, um, sadly for him that is, to their worst showing ever at that time. And I want to know, given your close proximity to him at that time, how did he sort of wake up every day, go to work, just keep on keeping on um, in the face of such difficult odds as the leader of the opposition? Well, I think one of the things that I think really characterized the gentleman that he was, but also the political leader that he was, was that he was really motivated by ideas and ideals and policies. And when you saw the great fight on free trade back in the 1988 election, you can see what an influence that had. He stayed true to that, that viewpoint throughout his whole life, right up until the last year, he gave an interview just a few months ago on YouTube. So I think he was simply motivated by winning power. And so he saw the 84 as an opportunity to kind of rebuild. We were also a little shell-shocked. I came in with 10 new MPs 
most of the others who had survived, there were 30 others who basically didn't want to be in the limelight or whatever. So we ended up treating the rat pack and we had some gnarly years fighting at the uh, ankles of the government. And I think that helped him also because he did have a whole coterie of young new MPs who kind of picked up the slack when the, uh, the leader and some of the other um, more senior members and knowledgeable members realized that when the public repudiates you like that, you're better off to step back a bit. So that's what he did in the beginning, um, but in the same gracious way that he did throughout his life. Mark, was your first connection with him in that 1984 leadership in which he came back from private life and back into public life? It, it sure was, Steve. And I, I uh, was very much involved in the Liberal Party from the mid-70s. Um, and as, as everybody on this call knows, he was originally looking uh, not to come back into politics. In 79, when the when uh, Prime Minister at the time, uh, uh, Pierre Trudeau, was defeated and, and resigned, he was, he was more or less coerced into coming back in 79, he decided against it. And as he said, in 84, they twisted his arm right out of his socket so that he could come back. Uh, and he did. Um, I, I, um, I think it's great, Stephen, first of all, uh, that the three of you are doing this. And I got to say, he had a relationship with all three of you. I want to say uh, to you, Sheila, uh, that he absolutely adored you. And, and uh, obviously, your father was very important to him. And um, I, I've got to tell a little story, Steve, about the 80. Well, when Sheila um, was uh, gracious enough to resign when she had an election issue back in the 90s, uh, Turner said to me, hey, there's a by-election. We're going down to Hamilton. And uh, we went down to Hamilton to work on her campaign. And, and we went to this person's house to, to, uh, to get her to go out and vote. And she says, I can't go and vote. I'm babysitting my kids. And he said to me, I'll take you in Keeley's car. Keeley, you babysit her kids. And he took off with his woman to go and get her to vote, Sheila, for you. That's probably why he won. And the, uh, the, the, he always loved Erwin Kotler, Stephen. He used to say, uh, and this is, I'm going to say this expletive deleted deliberately, he's a legend. So I, I thought that, uh, Erwin, you did learn at the, feet of a, at the foot of a master, and you performed extraordinarily well as your own master. So we're very, very honored to, uh, I'm very honored to be here with all of you. But yes, Thank I did start at 84. I have to say that the first encounter he had with me, I think he also had second thoughts whether he should have hired me because I had an office adjacent to him and he came into the office and I had a big picture of Che Guevara on, on the wall. And he said to me, what's that? I said, well, that's the picture of my, my hero, Che Guevara. And he says, well, you know, he's a real radical. I said, no, he's a due process radical. In any case, he did his homework, uh, came back and a week later told me, you know, this Che Guevara, your hero, who's years executed a lot of people in prison. So I, I still kept the picture on the wall, but after a while I did more homework and uh, Turner, uh, I then took the picture down. But the, the funny part also in this thing is I had, as it was mentioned, uh, very long hair and horn rim glasses. We made paid a visit to uh, John Mitchell, then the Attorney General in the Nixon administration. And we walk in to meet Mitchell and <laughs> Turner introduces me to Mitchell. Mitchell looks at me, looks at Turner, and he says, you let guys who look like that work for you? And Turner then says, well, he's, he's my one resident radical. So <laughs> we just had a lot of fun doing the important work that he was doing. Let the record show that apparently uh, long hair was okay in the 1980s as well. That's a, uh, that, that's a shot from the 84 leadership with a oh, very, uh, with a younger and thinner Steve Pakin having covered the uh, wow. convention and uh, standing beside the, the uh, poster of the winning guy. But, uh, I, I, I wanted to pick up, you mentioned John Mitchell, and of course he did have strong relationships with, with politicians from all over the world. And Mark, maybe you could pick up on this part of the story. Was he not a pallbearer at Robert F. Kennedy's funeral? He was, indeed he was a pallbearer at his funeral. And he How tells a great relationship with RFK start. Uh, well, the, the Kennedy family he had a relationship with, and I, I don't know, or I'm not certain that a lot of people knew that uh, John Turner's stepfather had a railway across Canada and down the eastern seaboard of, of the United States, and, and actually Irwin in Cuba as well. But uh, one of the things that, that uh, he used to do is he said, my stepfather did some work with, uh, with uh, uh, Joseph Kennedy 
in the latter part of the 20s. So I don't know what they were doing. But anyway, it, it, uh, in the 30s and 40s uh, and 50s, Turner was down at Hyannisport quite a bit uh, with the Kennedys. He had a good relationship with both, uh, both Bobby and John. And in, in the later life, Sheila, you recall, we went to Washington to, uh, to visit with, um, with Ted Kennedy, which was an extraordinary experience for me because uh, they're just talking about, uh, about Bobby Kennedy uh, Stephen, when he's in Washington with Ted Kennedy, it was really fascinating. But he um, he was with uh, Bob Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, uh, three days before he was assassinated in Madison, Wisconsin. He tells that story. That about? He Kennedy had called him, uh, yeah. as the story goes, to come down and give him a briefing on Canada. At the time, Kennedy was uh, it was in the primaries, and he was seeking to uh, know a little bit more about Canada. And, and that's an interesting story too, because Turner always. Uh, wanted to make sure that the United States had a really decent and uh, an effective relationship with Canada. And uh, so he, he said, come and meet me in Madison, John. And John went down. He said he greeted a whole bunch of kids. And he said, Bobby Kennedy gave the uh, speech of his life. He talked to young kids and said, I need you. I want you. I need the best and the brightest. And uh, it was uh, it was it was a wonderful, touching experience that John uh, Turner had recounted because he said after that speech, we went out for some steak and a couple of drinks, and then uh, we talked about Canada and U.S. relations. And he said that three days later he was assassinated. He always welled up at that story, Stephen, but it was um, it was wonderful. Hmm. I've noticed just parenthetically here that uh, Mr. Codler and Mr. Keeley have both referred to him as just. Turner when telling stories. And I, it just raises a question from me. Uh, for example, Sheila, when, when he was the leader and you were in his caucus, what did you call him? He called him Mr. Turner. <laughs> okay. And uh, it's funny because when uh, Mark is mentioning him welling up, I can really see that because one of the things that probably did him up so much in his public persona was that he was a very uh, deep uh, familial person. Um, when I ever, whenever I would be in Toronto and have lunch with him in the latter years, a couple of times at his club and then at a restaurant closer to home when he wasn't as able to get around, he always wanted to know what my daughter was up to, what my husband was doing. He was very plugged into the other part of his life that wasn't just political. And I think that's why I think a lot of people misunderstood back in 84, probably the worst blow was the so-called bum padding incident with Iona Campagnolo because she was the, so the president of the party. To me, I took that as um, a tactile way for a person who really liked to touch people. And I'll tell you a funny story on that account because I was running for my life in that election. As you know, it was a horrible election for the Liberals. And her, uh, the Honorable Herb Gray, right Honorable Herb Gray and myself were the only Liberals elected outside of Toronto. So they started chasing me down the hallway when Mr. Turner had this supposed altercation with Iona Campagnolo and said, what is your comment? You know, you're a young woman running. What do you think about this horrible sexist thing? And I said, well, I said, frankly, I'm absolutely shocked. I thought I had a pretty good behind and he's never been near it. So I just <laughs> thought, tried to turn it off. In the when, I, when I got to know him really well on the Hill, he was almost like... Um, a father it was like a fatherly relationship he would um reach out and touch you but not in any way that was inappropriate or sexual for that time probably today it would be different but it was really just kindness and somebody who really wanted to reach out and touch you and i thought that was probably the worst thing that the worst misinterpretation of of john turner that that i ever saw in the years that i was in politics and that hurt us badly and as you were saying going into the 84 election there was a lot of internal strife there was a very um, difficult time internally in the party, so um, that made it even more difficult. So he had to climb back from something that was really tough. Mark, the bum padding incident, though, spoke to a criticism that many people had of, of him at the time, which was he'd been in the private sector for eight and a half years, and when he came back into public life, he was rusty and didn't have his A game. That was a fair criticism, wasn't it? Oh, sure. And he'll say that it was, too. He wasn't ready. He said uh, he'll, he'll say that he didn't even have a chance to catch his breath. There was a lot of pressure on him to call that election. Um, he knew that the uh, uh, the House of Commons was restless for a camp or for an election. So, yeah, he and, and I think at the same time, uh, you know, there was that bravado. But to, to get to the whole point about 
about the, the, the tactile John Turner, he, he was very aware uh, that uh, that was a stupid thing for him to have done. But and I'll just say this, because this relates to Sheila. Sheila's daughter was born, uh, Sheila used to breastfeed her daughter in her office uh, on the hill. And Turner used to know that. So when I was his, uh, his Ontario assistant, he'd say, hey, you're going to have a meeting with Sheila? She breastfeeds her kid. So just make sure you don't react. That was that was the way Turner uh, responded to those kinds of things, because he was very aware that uh, uh, life had changed in those eight years that he was out of politics. And I, I think he, he grew up real fast at 84. I, I, I'm very candid about it. The other thing to that, my office was right around the corner from his because we were in four twins. Anyway, it doesn't matter, around the corner from his office. And he would always bring flowers in for the women who were members of parliament. So Lisa Haley, who was working for him and then came to work for me and stuff, one time came around with this lovely basket of tulips. And it was in the middle of the tulip festival. And then about an hour later, somebody came running by and said, please, please, don't tell Gilles that John Turner cut down all the tulips in their yard because she thought some people had come in and done it. And he was literally delivering tulips to the women members of Parliament, which is part of his gentleman approach. And is it the same as it is today? No, it's not. But 1984 was not today either. And I think um, you can see John, Joe Biden having a bit of the same problem where he supposedly touched somebody or grabbed their arm or something. And then people tend to. Um, react differently today than they would have been. I think he was doing it in a genuinely uh, friendly and outreaching way to keep life on the hill sane. Erwin Kotler, when you worked for him, what did you call him? And then later in life, what did you call him? Well, well when I worked with him, I, I called him uh, Mr. Turner. And then later in life, I, uh, you know, would call him uh, uh, John. Uh, but um, he, our relationship developed quite quickly. By the way, you mentioned something with regard to uh, RFK. You know, I didn't know John Turner at all. I wrote him a letter straight from Yale that I was interested in, in working with him. And then I got a letter back telling me to come for an interview. And after I was hired, he said, you know, he said, I uh, was very friendly with uh, Robert Kennedy. He said, and uh, I knew that you cared a lot about Robert Kennedy said, uh, he said, that that was enough for me. And it was quite interesting, the RFK connection, my getting hired and, and that kind of legacy. But also with what Sheila was saying, he was a, an incredible people person. I remember when we came to Halifax and we bumped into a, a woman, I never forgot this, and the woman had met him before, but she came up to him and she said, you know, Mr. Turner, you don't remember me. I'm, and he said, oh, no, of course I remember you. And then he named her children, the three children. And then he asked about the three children. And, you know, this was not only an incredible memory, but an incredible connection. I mean, he cared. And he, and I, I remember afterwards how she went away feeling, you know, this is an, an incredible person. He just didn't meet me in a formalistic way. He really remembered, he cared, remembered the names. And that's the way he was. Mark, I uh, I want to put on the record right now, and I have no hesitation saying it, that you were uh, probably well. You, you were like uh, you were like a fifth kid to him in many ways. I mean, you he, he he loved you very much. He often told people that uh, you probably spent more time with him, save and except for his wife in the latter part of of his life. Uh, took him out to lunch every week. Uh, made sure that he was. Uh, made sure that he was taken care of. I mean, you had a very lovely, loving relationship with him. And so I, I, I want to tap into that and see whether he ever, you know, did he ever um, confess to you at any point that, you know, 84 went so badly, that election, and then he ran again in 88 and he lost that one too. Did he ever say to you, you know, I should have just stayed in the private sector and, and not come back into public life because it just, it didn't, it didn't work out and, and he no doubt cost himself millions upon millions of dollars of lost income by coming back into public life had he just stayed. Did he ever say that to you? He never said that. And and uh, I, I don't think there was one day of regret that John Turner had for what he had done. I can see that Stephen, you know, the books are gonna be written about this anyway. In 84, as you know, Sheila, and you know Erwin, the party was in ruin. There was no liberal party per se. Uh, the, 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 the administration at the time, of the party and the elected officials really didn't care too much about uh, the Liberal Party. So he inherited a mess. He inherited a party that was in ruin. Uh, 
And, and I know this because of, of the campaign that we put on from February until uh, June of 1984, that the outreach to people across country to get them to sign up as, as liberals was very effective. And a lot of it was Turner's tactile uh, ability, as the and when we lost in in 84 yeah it was tough on him and i think he knew he had to wear that uh but that was the the, the next day after the election he was saying look you guys are gonna stick around we got a lot of work to do and uh we i think we not only had uh 88 steve but we also had 86 which was the leadership review and it was a constant as he liked to call it a mind-numbing siege that, that he had to uh, you know to prepare for that and you saw that number we got a, we had a great number in in uh, in, uh, in 1986 at the leadership review and then uh, life life got uh, really tough as we prepared for um, 88 but I'll tell you too Turner knew that he was public property I can tell you that and even later in life he had this idea that look I'm not just a, a good looking guy who's had a pretty decent career I, I I really he really firmly believed that he was public property. And what did but you the call him? Thing, Mark was the the one element that really tore the party apart was the constitutional element, because there were at that was the time when the Meech Lake Accord had been negotiated. Mr. Mulroney had given it three years to be ratified. There was a deep split in the party, not so strong in the in the caucus. I think only ten members of the caucus did not vote with the leader. I did vote with the leader. I know you did, yeah. But there was a lot of internal politics attached to that that made the time internally that much more difficult because you weren't one big happy family it's amazing when you get to power all of a sudden everybody's one big happy family but when you're in the opposition you usually go about five people trying to run the family so it was, well, and, and, the and, and you, was probably the exactly. most difficult Exactly, Sheila. And you knew that there was this dynamic, um, not only uh, after the election in 84, but this, this dynamic after uh, the leadership review, after the Beach Lake Accord was was uh, introduced. I, I think that the party really had, um, you know, there were toing and froing happening, as you as you quite rightly mentioned, Sheila. But, but he knew that, uh, and he kept saying this even back in the in the 60s when he was working with you, Lauren, that um, that he he believed in distinct society for Quebec, and yeah. and I think I think he you know to say it's it's important or it's an imperative for me to uh, uh, to bring forward my support for the Meech Lake uh, Accord. I thought that was uh, a very courageous thing for him to have done. And Mark, what did you think though? When don't forget, he had been an MP from Montreal also, so he had a. I think he's the only member of Parliament who's actually sat and been elected as a to the highest office of the land, which is member of Parliament in three provinces. Just says right. a lot about his character too. That, you know, that would be I, I a sometimes... great story, but it's not actually accurate. I think Wilfred Laurier <laughs> was in three provinces, and I think Mackenzie King was too. Oh, okay. So, so that, that's why Steve, I actually qualified it. Said I think, and I knew you would probably have the the true facts. That of course he would. Of course he would. And he's following Sir Wilfred Laurier and Mackenzie yeah. King. So how bad is that? <laughs> he's in good company. Erwin Kotler, you wanted to say. No, I just want to say, I, I saw a lot of the focus has been, you know, about the, the political aspect and the leadership races and the like. I always felt that he had a great legacy as justice minister, which has never been fully appreciated. I mean, he institutionalized reforms that are with us to, to the present day. Uh, criminal law reforms, the first reform of the bail law in a hundred years, the decriminalization of homosexuality, started work on what then became uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, established the National Law Reform Commission, which regrettably was dismantled by the Harper government, was an important institutional initiative, as was establishing the Federal uh, Court of Canada, you know, a whole legacy regarding independence, re, uh, judicial uh, appointments. Uh, regarding law and poverty, he established a whole neighborhood legal system, uh, legal services system that we are the beneficiaries of today, whether Parkdale Community Legal Services in Toronto or the Point St. Charles Legal uh, Clinic in Montreal. Environmental law, he was a leader. He was reading, I remember we would sit together and he would be reading Rachel Carson's A Silent Spring. He had a commitment then, you know, to environmental. I mean, I can go on. What I'm saying is he created a legacy that we are the beneficiaries of today and i in a very modest way was able to try and implement some of it when i was justice minister i do want to do a quick follow-up with you on that though mr cutler because I, I do i think i recall anyway and it's it's actually 50 years ago next month that mr turner said 
you know, I have intelligence that there's an apprehended insurrection on the way, and I will share it with you someday. And it was that information upon which the government of the day brought in the War Measures Act, and we're 50 years later, and we're still waiting to find out what that uh, that intelligence leaning to an apprehended insurrection was. He never did make it public. No, uh, I remember when I uh, had a talk with, with Trudeau at the time, because I think, you know, Turner was somewhat concerned with the manner in which the whole uh, invocation of the War Measures Act occurred, et cetera. And I remember when I was discussing it with, with uh, Carol at the time, and he said to me, well, Erwin, the fact that an insurrection did not occur does not mean that it could not have been apprehended. Uh, you know, Trudeau's very dialectical way of, of, of discussing <laughs> things. But uh, I'm, I'm not privy to the information that uh, JNT had, but I can tell you that he was very much engaged uh, on the issue uh, at the time. Well, you mentioned Trudeau, and Mark, let me pick up the story there, because when the Meech Lake constitutional process came forward, uh, Mr. Turner did support it. He said that's the right side of history to be on. Uh, but then Pierre Trudeau came out of retirement and absolutely dropped a bomb on his former party. And I, uh, did, Mr. Turner must have talked to you at various points about what he felt about Pierre Trudeau doing that to him and to the Liberal Party. What did he tell you? Well, he, he uh, oftentimes he he made the point very clear that uh, he he and uh, and Pierre Trudeau had a great relationship. A lot of people felt differently. He's you know he he was very clear making the distinction between a political enemy, which he absolutely had none, and a political opponent, and he had many. And and uh, I think he he respected the fact that Trudeau uh, Senior had come out with uh, what he had done about Meech Lake, but he said, I'm going to be a prophet on this one, Steve, and he kept saying that a lot. I'll be I'll be a prophet on Meech Lake, and he proved it in 1995, and he's proving it today. It's interesting that, uh, and I've heard this before, that he had a good relationship with Pierre Trudeau, and yet he resigned as finance minister in 1975 from Pierre Trudeau's cabinet, which was widely interpreted as a lack of confidence in the economic philosophy of the government of the day. So how was it they had such a decent relationship, and yet he resigned from his cabinet? If you're asking me, I yeah. can tell you, but but uh, I'll tell you what he told me. Um, and, and I think this was a very interesting uh, issue, and, and I'll preface it by saying this. We went to uh, the Canadian Media Hall of Fame Awards. I believe you were there, uh, Steve. This was years ago. And uh, the three recipients of the Canadian Media Hall of Fame Award that year were Peter Kent, Peter Mansbridge, and, um, and Lloyd Robertson. And, and Lloyd Robertson and Peter Kent had gone up or excuse me, Lloyd Robertson and, and Peter Mansbridge went up to the microphone to speak, and both of them said that for them, the most interesting part of their career in politics was when Turner resigned in 75. And then uh, when we were leaving, I'm asking, why would they say something like that? And they, he, they, he made the, the point very clearly. He said, I, I fought that election with Prime Minister Trudeau against Stanfield's uh, wage and price controls. And and uh, he said, we thought this was great. We we uh, were reelected to a majority government, as you can imagine. And he said, so we were on the side of right. And then there was a, a 180 degree turn where the prime minister said, we're going to institute wage and price controls. And he could not abide that. And he even said, look, I'm going to have this discussion with you. I'm going to tell you point blank what you're doing. These are his words, not mine, is reckless. And that goes against what we campaigned uh, in the election. And I can't in all good conscience abide that. And so he said, the only thing I could do is leave. And so he, that's exactly how he, he how he how he did it, Stephen. And that's exactly how he felt. But it wasn't because he hated uh, Pierre Trudeau. He didn't like what he'd done, and he was a man of great ethic from that perspective. Yeah, I can confirm that that was exactly as I understood it, and it was a, a a decision on principle, but it didn't affect his personal relations. Okay, Sheila Cops, I want to take you to the lead up to 1988 and the so-called fight of his life. If there was something that put a lot of wind back into his sails, it was the fight against Brian Mulroney's free trade agreement. What do you remember from that time? Well, I just remember that debate uh, because, I mean, at, up until that point, if you recall, um, I remember quite clearly that there were all kinds of books being written and people were leaking chapters of books and the campaign. Just every day you'd open the paper and you go, oh, my God, not another, not another uh hit job on John Turner, really. And so we were struggling, and then we went into that debate, and he just so um, eloquently and precisely put the case for Canada in terms of our economic and political independence. 
that all of a sudden we just saw it in the polls. Now, of course, Mulroney, being a very good politician as well, was ready. And the next day, I think they even had a tabloid newspaper that they gave out at every subway station in Toronto, basically listing all the rotten things that Turner had said. And But he was able, in the space of one uh, presentation, one debate, to really take us, give us a bump of about 15 points. Of course, some of it came back, but we ended up, I think, in the end, I think we ended up with 88 seats or something in that neighborhood, which which was more than doubling of what we had. And if you look at the weeks during the campaign, there were weeks when we thought we'd be back at the 40 mark. So in retrospect, I think it was a pretty good performance on his part. And and like we said earlier, he, he believes that to this day. He hasn't wavered in his, in his viewpoint. Apparently, uh, Alan Gregg, the pollster, said that Mr. Turner's performance at that debate was so good that he had built a bridge of trust between himself and the Canadian people, and that the only way that Mulroney could win that election is if they bombed that bridge, which they did, <laughs> which they did. Uh, Mark, I, I do want you to pick up, though, on the story that emerged in the middle of that campaign. Sheila just referenced it, and it was, it might be the most astonishing story around a political leader, I mean, ever to happen in our lifetime. You know, it's the lead, it's in the middle of the election campaign, and Peter Mansbridge, in the field, does a story on what he says is an attempt to replace Mr. Turner as leader in the middle of the campaign. When when Mr. Turner saw that story, heard about that attempt, what was his reaction? Well, he was he was surprised. Number one, um, he was uh, angry. Number two, but uh, number three, I think he said, you know, we gotta we gotta bear down here, and I, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly. Um, what ended up happening? He knew that there was there was uh, talk about him being replaced as a leader, and the reason why, and Sheila, you could confirm this, was that his back was so sore, he had this twisted muscle in his back, Stephen, that he could hardly walk. And so there was this talk. Well, look, why don't we push you aside, and then uh, we could get uh, Mr. Kitchen to come in as the uh, as the um, uh, runner up to the leadership to take your place during this. And I remember even the conversation at one point, even before the debate. I thought this was wonderful. Uh, that uh, uh, Mulroney looked over at him and said, "You know, if Kretchen was here, I was going to ask him how did you get here," which I thought was a really interesting uh, uh, sort of way for them to start out that whole uh, campaign or to start the whole debate. But he he, uh, he 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 just thought, "Look, we're going to." This is a lot of noise, and I remember we were in Hamilton, Sheila, and uh, we had this uh, this. Um, event at the Sheridan Center, and when we were leaving, he just said, look, I'm going to go talk to some real people, because Mansbridge had sort of created this, the coup was this, uh, you know, this thing that was going to, uh, just going to um, uh, annihilate the Liberal Party going into that, but he fought like hell, uh, just fought like hell, even with his back as sore as it was, but Stephen, he, he's a, he was a true fighter on that, and, and as the leader, wanted to rebuild the party, and, and I think that the, uh, uh, free trade um, debate certainly put him in a position too because he kept saying I'm going to be a prophet on this one as well and he has been. Was there anything to the mutiny story? Oh there was Stephen. But, <laughs> there, uh, was. there was. Where there's smoke there's usually some fire yeah. <laughs> but I think that was the difficult if you look back to that election that's what made it so difficult for those of us who were kind of in the field trying to trying to pump people up. It's a bit like in the last election when um, Kathleen Wynne decided to announce that she wasn't running and I was knocking on doors with the local candidate in Ottawa and somebody said well is the Liberal Party pulling out of the race? Like that's what the 88 campaign was, uh, was like until that magical moment of the debate when all of a sudden we all felt now we've got something to fight for. So it really is almost more an internal uh, souffle d'affray, if you want to call it, a breath of fresh air in a campaign that had a lot of stench in it. Hmm. Erwin Kotler, I, uh, let me start with you in um, another round of questioning, and that is, you know, we touched on his relationship with Pierre Trudeau, which, you know, you all tell us was a lot better than perhaps the way history has painted it. I don't think there's any confusion about the nature of the relationship with Jean Chrétien. Uh, that was terrible. And I wonder if you could start by telling us what elements or manifestations you saw or explanations there were behind the fact that Mr. Turner and Mr. Chrétien were, were, you know, Mark, you said he had no political enemies. He only had political opponents. I think Mr. Chrétien might have been a political enemy. But anyway, Mr. Kotler, why don't you pick up the story from there? Well, uh, Mark may be able to speak to this better than I can because, you know, my relationship with, with uh, uh, John Turner was really one that began 
uh, when he was Minister of Justice, and it continued within that framework and dynamic. With regard to the interpersonal thing, uh, with regard to Jean Chrétien, we never really uh, discussed it, even though Chrétien had himself been Minister of Justice uh, for a period, and uh, also in particular as it related to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I think when it came to issues, um, Turner was able to be very respectful on the issues. And on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, they shared a concurrence along with Trudeau about the importance and the compelability of having a charter. On the interpersonal thing, I don't have much that I can add to it. And so perhaps um, Mark can enlighten us in a way that I can. Mark, have I overstated it by saying they they may have been political enemies as opposed to just opponents? Well, look, uh, I, I'm not going to characterize his relationship uh, with Mr. Pichen as, uh, as that of being enemies. I think they've had a you know a storied um, relationship for years. But I will say that uh, you know 84 was was a tough loss for one of those candidates, and uh, and they that, that continued over the years. But look, uh, in um, when when Kretchen turned 80, Turner was one of the honorary chairs of his of, of that party. Um, and, and last year at that great uh, birthday party that uh, all of you were at, Kretchen uh, was there and spoke very, very eloquently about his relationship with John Trump. So uh, I have this great picture, Stephen, um, at that uh, birthday party where where Kretchen walked over to Turner in the, in the, in the room before the event, the answer room, and was whispering in his ear. And so I went over and I said, why did Kretchen whisper in your ear, Turner? And he says, he and he does a terrible Kretchen impersonation. He just says, he said, I'm not taking names, John. And I thought that was an interesting uh, way for him to, to sort of put that uh, that whole issue behind them. But I, just, I, can also... I think it's also fair to say that because the original competition was based on the desire that both had to be the leader and there was an internecine element to that, sometimes the the work of underlings in in both camps can be more vicious than that of the actual leaders themselves because the, there were some people in the party, including some people in the caucus, who were working hard to destabilize Turner because they wanted Gretien. And um, I don't think it all came from the leaders themselves. Like I said, Mark, Mark organized that beautiful event with Lisa Haley, uh, which was held for Mr. Turner's 90th birthday. And he had every single former leader there, including Mr. Gretien, or by... Uh, I, I thought Brian Mulroney actually had the best line of the day great. when he said he was going to be here, but he had, but his wife had, had another option. He had no option. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> forty years later. So that you when, when people get out of politics, I think that the hard edges soften up a bit. Let's put it that way. And over the years, they've softened up quite a bit. Yeah, that and 90th you, birthday celebration was an, an incredible remembrance and an incredible moment. I think in Canadian political history. Uh, the way all the former leaders, all parties came out and authentically, you know, spoke of, of their relationship and respect uh, for John Turner. I have to say that, you know, I was an MP while Jean Chrétien was uh, prime minister uh, before Paul Martin took over. And uh, I never heard from him any adverse word with regard uh, to John Turner. He knew that I had worked with him. And the only things we would discuss were sort of common issues uh, which in which they had a shared commitment, as I mentioned, for example, with regard to the uh, charter, but no adverse word. And I think what Sheila said was uh, an important point that sometimes it's those working with them uh, who tend to create some uh, concern or if not sometimes antagonism, but it's not necessarily shared by the people whom they work for. Hmm. Although I will say, I and I don't know if Mark, you were there or Irwin, but I attended Jack Pickersgill's 80th birthday, and at the table were Pierre Trudeau, John Turner, and Jean Chrétien. And I think it was the last supper they'd sort of all had together at like a political birthday party. And I got a picture of that at the time, and it's one of, to this day, it's one of the political pictures that I really cherish. Because in a political party, oftentimes leaders who succeed each other don't always go to each other's birthday parties. Mm -hmm. That picture's hanging on my wall, Sheila. Oh, it's not a great picture. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, pick up this uh, line of questioning now. When Mr. Turner died, there was a headline in the Globe and Mail that said, John Turner, Prime Minister for 79 days, dies. And there was quite a firestorm of reaction on Twitter to that. 
Yes. I wonder if you could go into it. What did you think of that headline? Well, I thought it was. I thought it was, and and I'll I'll just say it. I thought it was. It was stupid. I thought it was very dishonorable, and it didn't. It didn't speak to the gravitas that he had uh, for all of those years prior to the fact that he was a prime minister for 79 days. I I spoke about this on Stephen Ledrew's show the other day, where I said I can't believe that that would be his legacy, and that people would think that 79 days as prime minister is uh is your only uh, is the only issue that 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 makes you. Uh, famous in this country. Listen to what Erwin Kotler said. I mean, the fact that he did all those reforms when he was Minister of Justice, it was the, uh, up until that time, he was the only Minister of Finance who had ever balanced the budget. Um, when you think about what he had done, even in, in the environment, this is an amazing uh, accomplishment. And over those years when he was in the House of Commons, courageously as the leader of the opposition, Sheila, to support the Meech Lake Accord against the, the thinking of his own party, to actually read a document about free trade that put him in a position to know more about the guy that was negotiating it, put him in a very strategically uh, advantageous position. And I believe, and I still believe this to this day, and, and Turner used to say, you're goddamn right, that, uh, that uh, this was, um, it not only was it the fight of his life, but he was a prophet on that. And he set the stage for Kretchen to be um, to have three majority governments. And, 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 and uh, I think that Kretchen would agree that the party was very, very sound when he took over in 1990. Thanks to John Turner. And Hugh Windsor actually, if you actually read the full story of his obituary, it was quite fulsome. So sometimes a headline doesn't tell the whole story because no. Hugh Windsor is usually a very fair person. When I read the headline, I thought, oh my God, like that was shocking to me because it was. Even um, in death, usually people don't point out to the the, the, the the small weaknesses you've had in your life, they point out to the large um, differences that you've made. It made so, so much a difference. So I was a bit, I was quite taken aback by that headline as well. And I thought the Twitter world kind of shut it down a bit. Yeah. Erwin Codler, you want to come in on that? Well, you know, I. I also was concerned when I saw uh, the headline. In fact, it's uh, inspired me now to write an op-ed on what I think is the real legacy uh, of John Turner that uh, we can remember him by, because as I said, uh, he institutionalized reforms that have become part of our public life today in so many ways that have been described you know, by Mark, been described by Sheila. I think that's the kind of legacy uh, by which he should be uh, remembered. And I also agree that when he uh, forged the comeback of the Liberal Party in 84 and, and 88, he paved the way for the Liberal Party then coming back uh, to power. In effect, Jean Chrétien was the beneficiary, as was the Liberal Party, and I believe the country, of uh, the work that John Turner had done politically, as well as as a reformer. As long as you have the floor, uh, we're going to take some questions now from those who are watching. and. Uh... I'm sure all of you remember the former Vancouver New Democrat MP Ian Waddell, who has a question in here uh, to Erwin Kotler saying, he says, I believe Turner appointed Tom Berger to the bench. Uh, Tom Berger, of course, having a, uh, a hugely impactful uh, career uh, on, on the bench in this country and his commission as well on indigenous issues. Um, Mr. Kotler, he says, can you talk about some of his judicial appointments? Well, the thing that impressed me most about uh, John Turner with regard to his appointments was the integrity of the appointment process. Uh, in other words, he wanted to ensure that that appointment process would not be politicized, that the appointments would be made uh, on merit. And I recall when somebody once wanted to mention somebody, a political person uh, who should be appointed, uh, and Turner said, it will be done only on merit. We didn't have then the open uh, merit-based appointment uh, process uh, that we have now. And frankly, when I initiated that as Minister of Justice, it was part of the legacy that I got from John Turner, the integrity of the appointments uh, process. And he saw the courts really as the pillar of constitutionalism. He had this great respect uh, for parliament as the trustee of the people, as he would put it, but the Supreme Court as uh, the pillar of constitutionalism. And therefore for him, judicial appointments, you know, had to both be marked by the integrity of the appointment process and by the distinction of the appointees. I have another question here. Um, this is from a Zach Pakin. Hmm. <laughs> why, why, why does that name ring a bell? I think, um, hmm, that's my oldest son. 
<laughs> uh, what was John Turner's impact on Canadian foreign policy throughout his long political career? Mark, you want to kick that one around? Well, I think it, there's there's zero question or, yeah, there's zero issue about his relationship with the United States uh, and Canada. And if, and and Irwin could testify to this, too. When he worked for him back in the day, he used to uh, go down to Washington. And, and I'll tell this story because Turner used to love telling this story but that uh, at the time, uh, President Nixon did not have a good relationship with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. So he used to send Turner down. And Turner yeah. used to always say, I'd go down and I'd, I'd uh, meet with George Schultz and we'd have a game of tennis and a couple of drinks and then we'd uh, sit down for dinner with the president. And he used to always tell the story about when he was uh, when he was with Nixon. Nixon said, Turner, you're taking a risk by being here. You've got no witnesses. And, uh, and uh, the, he used to say, Mr. President, if I thought I needed witnesses, I wouldn't show up. And he said that was the kind of relationship that we had. He said, we had five things to deal with. We dealt with them over dinner, and then I went back to, to Canada and reported that to to the uh, to the Prime Minister. As you know too, Stephen and Zach, I, I can tell you, he had a fantastic relationship with many uh, leaders in the Caribbean, and that uh, prompted a number of, uh, and later in life too, a number of those leaders in the CARICOM nations to use Turner in the 2000s for things like resilience as it related to disaster and disaster response in those uh, Caribbean nations by virtue of his relationship there. I'll tell you, I'll tell you this too, uh, Turner had an unbelievable relationship with uh, Ukraine. And uh, it was little wonder that uh, later in life, um, in 2004, when we were honored by, by your prime minister, um, uh, Irwin, to go to Ukraine to uh, oversee that election with a number of, of folks. And, uh, and Turner had really apported himself very, very well uh, in, um, in Ukraine, lecturing not only the Electoral Commission, but both Yanukovych and, and Yushchenko. And as everybody knows, Yushchenko became the, the president after that. And Turner had had a specific uh, time with both of them on how they ought to act with respect to the voice of the people in those countries. Now, my memory is a little scratchy on this. Was he not the head of the World Bank at one point as well? He was. He was the yeah. chairman of the World Bank when they when the the the, uh, the run on the U.S. dollar took place. Those are there's some great stories too, but we should save that for a a TVO <laughs> show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good enough. Uh, let me throw another question in here as well, and that is, um, uh, Sheila, why don't you start with this one? He was called a House of Commons man. Now that's an expression that you don't hear anymore. John Turner, a real House of Commons man. For the younger people watching this, what does that mean? Well, I think when you say a House of Commons man, it is it does there is a reference there to kind of the old boys club. And in the olden days, if you go back to even my time at Queen's Park, there was a little bar outside of the uh, door of the, uh, the chamber where the members of the government could go and play cards and have libations in between votes. Now, I think that's all gone by the boards now. But I I wouldn't I would say he was more of a House of Commons man, not in that kind of um, negative uh, old boys club way, but rather because he really truly did respect the voice of parliament. Uh, when we had a vo vote, for example, on the, uh, the war in the Persian Gulf and different opportunities to actually engage parliament. To him, and, I've, and I have worked with ministers who never were in parliament before they became ministers and they think the parliament can be sort of like an impediment or something to just fix on the way. He really knew how to respect parliament and how to, um, to, to use the voices of members of parliament as a, as a beacon for the direction of the government or the opposition. In that sense, I think he was a really uh, House of Commons man because he really did believe in the, in the process of parliamentary debate. Erwin Kotler he used to, if he said it to me once, he said it to me 10 times, you know why it's called Parliament, right, Steve? It's from the French parler, meaning to speak, to talk about. That's how we solve our problems here. We talk about them in the House of Commons. Is that part of being a House of Commons man? Well, you know, I felt that he, for him, he almost had a, a reverential view of, of Parliament. I remember telling him when I first began to work with him that when I was 11 years old, my father took me to uh, Ottawa and we stood outside the parliament building so my father said to me son this is used latin this is vox populi this is the voice of the people now today this would be met with a kind of mocking rejoinder but turner when i told him the story said yeah right that's it this is the voice of the people 
this is the highest calling. And he was prepared always to work across partisan lines if need be, because he always said the public interest comes above the partisan interest. So he was a House of Commons person in the sense of parliament as being the linchpin of democracy. And that was the forerunner of the public interest. Mark, what would you add to that? I would say this, that a lot of people don't know this, but after he left politics in 92, that on a, on a monthly basis, from the time uh, he left parliament until uh, 2019, we would go to a school anywhere in Canada, at least two or three times a month. And as a matter of fact, in 2019, in February, we went down to Arizona and he spoke at uh, two high schools and two universities, including Arizona. Arizona State, and his message was about uh, Canadian Parliament is that, and he loved this, he said, people govern people. And I thought that was a great line. When you when you think about that, just what that means and the, the power of those words, people governing people, it speaks to what Erwin says, and you know, Sheila absolutely lives that. So I think uh, those are legacy, um, those are legacy issues of Turner. We literally have time for one question left, and Mark, I'm going to put it to you, and, and it's, a, it's a very personal question, um, and then Andrew will come on and, and finish us off here, but I, I mean, obviously you saw more of him than anybody, uh, maybe save and except for his wife, and, and I presume you knew the end was close when he eventually died. The, the last time you saw him or spoke to him, can you share some of that with us? I spoke to him on the Thursday before uh, he died. We were planning on, on getting together the following Thursday, and um, and uh, you could just tell he was tired, but uh, he was still looking forward to getting together. So uh, and and he he you know somebody on this panel made the point about about Turner being relevant, and he still thought you know he talked a lot about what was happening and the three issues that were bothering him. I'll tell you was uh, this whole uh, issue between China and Canada. That was really bothering him. It was bothering him about the manner in which a parliament was just so acrimonious. And uh, he still hated the, he, he talked about this all the time, he hated the fact that uh, the member of parliament was still referred to as a backbencher if they weren't in cabinet. So he, those are the kinds of things that Turner would, would talk about almost uh, endlessly. And what did you call him when you were with him? I, I called him boss all the time. We called him boss uh, since 1984, but in public, I, I, I'd always call him Mr. Turner, or if I was getting uh, a little bit impatient because he was saying something too loud or something, just call him Turner. But uh, he, en he enjoyed that. Good stuff. Uh, I, I want to thank all three of you for those wonderful reminiscences. And let's pass it now over to Andrew Cardozo to wrap things up. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much, everybody. If I can just <clears throat> share one quick story. Um, when I was, uh, when he was leader of the opposition, I worked for an organization called the Canadian National Cultural Council. And at the end of his time, we, we used to meet with him every year and members of the caucus. At the end of his time, after he announced he was going to be stepping down, we gave him a plaque. And there were some very nice words said to him, and he said some very nice words back to us, the importance of of, of interacting with politicians. Then he held up the plaque and said, I assure you, I'll put this in the proper place. And we never quite knew what that meant, but it, it, sounded, it sounded nice. We hoped it meant a place of honor. Um, but it, it was always interesting that he was always there. Every single year, he was there to talk to a cross-section of, of ethnocultural groups and, and engage in dialogue. Um, I want to thank you, Steve, for, for being the moderator, for stealing yourself away from the great work you do at at uh, TV Ontario with the agenda. I uh, really appreciate your being here today. Uh, Sheila Copps and Irvin Kotler, thank you for, for your years of service to Canada and for sharing some of those years uh, with us today in the context of Mr. Turner's uh, 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 performance and role and, and contribution. Uh, Mark Keeley, I have to compliment you on your dedication uh, to Mr. Turner and uh, through, through his many years, both in public service and after and for being here to share those uh, stories and, uh, and and setting some of the records straight because you are probably as close as to the, the horse's mouth as, as we now have. I want to remind people that this, the state funeral for Mr. Turner will be on October the 6th at 11 a.m. 
And I want to remind uh, viewers that we have a couple of other webinars coming up, well, several webinars coming up in the next while, but two I can tell you about today. Uh, on October the 7th, we have a webinar with Lloyd Axworthy, who was mentioned earlier. We will be talking about John Turner, but also about um, other issues that he's involved in, in, in world affairs and refugee affairs. He's, he's also chair or president of the World Refugee Council now. And October 21, we'll be having a debate with um, a bipartisan, well, I should say discussion, a bipartisan discussion on the U.S. election, a session that we are co-sponsoring with the Canadian Club of Toronto and Democracy House. So please join us for that, and the details will all be on our website. So again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, keep well, keep safe, and all the best. Thank you.